Well, good morning, church. I'm thankful that you're here today, isn't it? It's been a great day so far to be in the house of the Lord. Turn with me, if you will, to Colossians chapter 2 is where we'll be tonight, today, not tonight. Well, you might still be here tonight, uh, depending on how riled up I get over this topic today. But today, as we continue in our Jesus, Our Everything series, session 4 is what I'm calling this one. I have a question for you as we start. You're going to see today in the takeaway how this pertains, but who are you? It's a good question, isn't it? Because we all take this question very serious, and at some time in our life, one way or another, we've had to ask this question of ourselves: who am I? What makes me respond in the ways that I respond? What makes me act the way that I act? How do I express myself in certain ways? It's almost like we're asked the question that I have to pick a side in life. What side do I want to be on? Next week, next Saturday, many of you in this room will be picking a side because there's some little football game in Jacksonville. And and there will be some of you who like each other today and hate each other next Saturday. You will be picking a side. But identity is an issue, and it has been for for years and years and years. For all of history, we have to deal with this identity issue. You see, all throughout history, we have seen that identity issues arise over things like the nationality of someone, the economics that are going on at the time, social issues, we see issues on race, we see issues on politics, we even see identity issues when it comes to religion. And these same issues that are going on then are going on now, and it's a pressure that comes upon us as we age in life. I read a psychology study this week that said that the most important time of identity in our life comes in our adolescence. When we try to define who we are and what we want and what we want to look like, act like, and be like. And and they were saying that a lot of that's formed in those crucial years of life. But these pressures make us, at some point in time, choose a side. Identity is influenced many ways. But it primarily starts in our home. What's being taught and exemplified in the home. It, 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 it spills over outside of the home into the cultures in which we're raised in. If you don't believe me, just run around and look at a lot of the kids that run around Stark that live in a rural town. And I can promise you, you would say they probably grew up in a rural town. If you were to go into a big city somewhere and identify students there, you would probably say these kids have never been to the country, right? Y'all know who I'm talking about. It affects our identity, our parents, our families, the culture, the people we hang around with. Those are all things that affect our identity. Those are all things that somewhat are controllable. But then there's things that are not controllable. Um, I have a height disadvantage. I am vertically challenged, as I like to tell people. But you know what God did for me? He gave me speed. To make up for my lack of height. So all those sports I wanted to play. Look if you're not tall just be fast. So if you're not tall and you're slow. I'm sorry. <laughs> but but, but it, there's things like that. That affect our identity. Our height. Our abilities. Our race. Socioeconomics. These are things that affect our identity. That shape our identity. And there are many ways for identity to express itself. Isn't there? I mean, I'm not going to get into all the ways today that we're dealing with identity in our culture today. But there are many ways in which identity expresses itself. So I I put all these, Pastor Gary, these are up here. So I I could uh, hopefully make an example that will apply to us today. Look look at all these hats. If if y'all paid attention, if you're not around um, younger generation much, I want to enlighten you, uh, maybe some of you that are, uh, as I was told today, welcome to the senior adult world. <laughs> Jason, you beat me there. Um, hats, just so you know, how many of you have teenage boys? Hats matter, don't they? 
don't mess with their hats. Their hats matter, and they have whole collections of walls of hats, and they might wear them one time, but don't mess with that hat. So hats today say something. I started looking at the psychology of hats even this week, and oh my gosh, like what does a fedora say? What does a cowboy hat say? What does a mountain hat say? Like what does a what does a regular baseball hat say? All of these things say something to us. But I, but I brought some out of my closet. I said, you know, um, if I put on this international harvester hat, am I a farmer? I love international harvesters. There's a whole other story on this. I'll explain it to you later someday. But, but if I'm wearing international harvester, you just assume that I have a red hat on with international harvester. I must love international harvesters. I, must, I probably own an international harvester or, in my case, wish I could own an international harvester. But, but this, doesn't, this does not identify me. It just identifies a hat, right? What if I'm wearing a hat like this one? This one says Chosen Road on it. If you were here when the Bluegrass Band came through Chosen Road, I bought a hat. Some of you did too. You, uh, you broke your bank to buy their hat, right? It was expensive. But, but this is a sign of maybe the music I listen to, but does the music define me? Because y'all would be surprised. I don't really listen to Bluegrass a whole lot. I like it live. I don't like to listen to it on the radio. And you probably would be shocked if you knew what actual kind of music that I really like to listen to in my own private time. It'd probably surprise you. If you want to know, just ask Joanne Price. She'll tell you that it's somebody like Seventh Day Slumber that I like to listen to. And you're like, oh, who is that? Well, y'all go look them up and then come back and tell me how awesome they are. <laughs> but, but my hat, kind of misleading. What about this one? Y'all know who this is? Where's Reed Pointer? Who's this? Where is he? I can't see the glass. That's the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. Y'all, I had to curl the hat because I can't stand flat brim hats. That's why I called Reed out. Because he likes the flat style hat. That's a big deal. But, but, but I'm not a huge fan of the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. We went to a ball game there, so I bought a hat. Because, but a hat says something about us, right? So there's the Devil Rays hat. Now he's starting to get a little more personal here. Might define me a little bit more. This is my Browning hat. My favorite rifle I shoot is a Browning. My favorite shotgun is a Browning. I love them. I have several of them, and my collection grows in them. I, I love them because I, I get to do things with them that I love. Now we're starting to talk about who I really am. This hat I'm wearing, it's a, it's a Browning hat. I love Browning rifles. Have I told you I love Browning rifles? I love Browning rifles. Now we start getting a little more personal. I'll get my pop's hat on. Y'all know little Will. Y'all see little Will run around here. I, I, I got this hat. What went Father's Day? It was a Father's Day gift from Will uh, for for being his pops. It was his gift to me, and so um, I love this hat. I don't wear it very often because I don't want to ruin it. I know it was bought for me to use, but I don't want to ruin it. My daughter bought me a turkey call one time with the picture of them at their wedding on it. Said, "Here, I want you to kill a turkey with it," and I, it took all I could to scratch that turkey call up because the picture was going to be distorted, but. I did try, but it doesn't sound like a turkey, so it doesn't get used. But I love this hat. It starts identifying who I am, right? It's, you're getting closer. I'm an outdoors guy. Yeah, I like sports. I like music. I like tractors. But all of a sudden, now, boy, I, I, I'm pops, right? Now we start getting into some identity who I am. If y'all don't know this hat, this symbol on this hat is the identification of the Florida Baptist Convention. It identifies us as, as me as a Southern Baptist who's part of a Southern Baptist church who supports the Florida Baptist Convention. Listen, I think as Southern Baptists we should support the Florida Baptist Convention. And every year we grow more and more in our support of the Florida Baptist Convention for what they're doing in international and North American missions. We are Baptists and we are Southern Baptists for that reason and that reason alone. I don't want to get into a debate with you on all the other things that are going on in the Southern Baptist world. But I'm going to tell you as long as they continue to send missionaries into this world, I will do as long as they stay doctrinally sound everything I can to support the work of evangelism and discipleship throughout the world and I will encourage us as a church to do so but this identifies me as a southern baptist especially specifically related to florida baptist convention but that still does not identify who I am now we're getting closer right Mr. Price got us some hats for our staff development day and not only am I southern baptist and belong to the florida baptist convention but I belong to a local church my identity says I am Southern Baptist at Northside Baptist Church in Stark, Florida. And I'm proud to wear this hat and identify with you great people as Florida Southern Baptist at Northside Baptist Church. But this ultimately still does not define or identify me. And somebody so nicely came this week 
brought me a hat and said, hey, I think you need to wear this on feeding Bradford Day. And I looked at it and I said, okay, I'll wear this. And then as the week progressed and I started thinking about the message we were given and how I was going to talk about identity today and get to today's takeaway, I realized I was given a gift this week that clearly defines the hat I should be wearing. The hat, front of this hat says, Jesus, and it has an arrow, and it says, one way, the only way. This is what should identify me. Not what things I might like, not what might things like I might want to do. The hat is, this, this hat right here should identify who I am to my core. All these other ones mean different things, don't they? And depending on the day and what I'm doing and where I'm going, I might pick a different hat. I pick a lot of times, I pick hats. I know you, you teenage boys do the same thing, right? You pick a hat. Let's, girls, this is like your shoes. It matches your outfit. Like you've got a hat for every shirt you have in your closet because you're going to match your hat to your outfit. But, but we can change these hats. That's the thing about That's the beauty about hats. I can, I can take it off and I can change it. And depending on the occasion, I can put on a new hat. But, you know, we do the same thing with our spiritual walk. Some days we have these mountains, these hurdles, these things that we've seen God move in the past. And for whatever reason, we just have a hard time believing God's going to get us over that mountain or through that mountain. And so sometimes we take the hat off. But listen, I'm just going to here to tell you that we're going to talk about this today, about our identity in Christ. You can't take that hat off. Our identity in Jesus needs to be fixed. The problem is, it's ultimately not really the hat that defines us, is it? It's not really the hat that identifies. It's the hat that everybody else can see. But my relationship with Jesus is who identifies me. And I need to be fixed on Jesus. Satan's a lot like hats. He, I think he uses hats in this analogy. He gets you to think you can just take it off and swap it out. Like it doesn't really matter. It's no big deal. Jesus is okay with you just experiencing the world and doing what you want and Heck, he even created it for your enjoyment. So why can't you take uh, that hat on or change that hat from this hat to this hat? It doesn't really matter, Jesus. Jesus isn't going to care. These are the kinds of ways that Satan tempts us. Listen, I know when we all think about sin and we all think about Satan, we want to talk about the big sins. But do you know how Jesus throws the church off? With all those little sins. Just get you to change your hat for a moment. And we start arguing over petty little tiny things. But Jesus says... No, none of this is true. Your identity is found in him and him alone. That's what our spiritual walk should be like. When, we, when, when we're changing hats so often, it's what the Bible refers to like the wind coming in and tossing us to and fro, living in a place of chaos and confusion. And so today, as we think about hats and we think about our identity, here's today's takeaway. Understanding your identity in Christ allows you to live above Satan's control. There is some control that Satan has. And when we understand our identity and where it comes from, we can live above him. So I want to unpack the scripture today that Paul's looking at. And, and I want to be able to walk through this, all of this section of scripture, the first 15 verses of chapter 2. I want us to look at it and see how we can get a better understanding of how we can come to a better understanding of our identity in Jesus Christ. So if you'd stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. It's found in Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. The Holy Spirit says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with the plausible arguments, for though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Verse 6, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. 
And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised from him the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the circumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing triumphing over them in him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we come to you now. We thank you for your word. And God, as we unpack this idea about our identity in the scripture today, I pray that you would just help us come to the basic truth and understanding our identity in you, growing in all these areas that the Bible is going to talk to us about today, that it's growing in you allows us to live above Satan's control in our lives. So may you bless the teaching and preaching of your word today. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. couple things today that I want us to look at. Three Ps that you may have on your thing that will help us with today's takeaway to understand our identity in Christ. The first one is this. I would call it proficiency. That we must become proficient. And, and what are we going to become proficient in? What are we going to become experts in? It's this. It's growing in knowledge and wisdom. Look at verses 2 and 3. That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is in Christ. In Him who are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul says if we're going to claim Christ as our Savior, then there's something that we must do. And it's something that he's praying that this church does. It's something that I believe if Paul was here today and he was in another part of the world, he would be praying for us here at Northside. And that is that we reach, we reach the riches of the full assurance of who he is. So here's the first thing in reaching this assurance. First is this, is that we understand all the blessing, all the understanding, all of the knowledge is found in Christ. Everything that we need is found in the person of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30, it's been a long time ago, but beginning of this year we studied this. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. It is important that we understand in our identity that we are in God. That it all begins with Christ. Everything begins with Christ. The Bible says that He is the wisdom. He is the righteousness. He is the sanctification. He is the redemption. And so the Bible says if you've professed Him as Lord, you are in Him. Now I know we go around a lot of times as churches and as pastors, we say that it's Christ in you. And I believe the Bible does teach about Christ in you. And when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. And therefore we have the power of God and Christ living in us. But I want you to understand something even deeper than that. When you come to know Jesus and give your life to Jesus, you are in Him and all of who He is. Think about it for a moment. We are in Him. Not just some of Him. Not just a part of him, but all of him. Proficiency begins in Christ. So when we come to this, and we're going to see this a little bit more in a moment, but when we come to this understanding, it's then and only then can we begin to reach the full assurance that Christ wants us to have. Secondly, we must obtain Wisdom and knowledge. I, I was thinking about this idea this week of obtaining wisdom and knowledge. Why, why didn't God just give us, I'm thankful for a conversation I got to have this morning, just reassurance of what's going on in the, in the text today and what God's doing in our church and in our lives. But, but why didn't God just give us, when we got saved, all the wisdom and knowledge that we need of who he is? Wouldn't that have been nice? Wouldn't you have liked to actually have had that? Like, man, it would be nice to know all these things. Well, I, I'm convinced it's, it's, it's for his glory that we don't know all of those things because he, he intended on us having a process of growing in wisdom and knowledge to war him. He didn't give us everything we needed. And I, and I think the simple reason is he wanted us to pursue that relationship. 
He wants us to pursue this gaining of knowledge and wisdom as, as the idea of becoming proficient. Well, why? Because when we learn things, we tend to trust them more, don't we? We tend to believe them more. I mean, think about when you're trying to talk a little kid into tasting some kind of food that you know is absolutely incredible, like peach cobbler. Mm. Had some yesterday. And they're like, "Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm." and they tight-lipped, and they're not trying, they're not trying, but then all of a sudden when they taste it, man, they they want more of it, don't they? Well, if they knew peach cobbler was good, I mean, why would you enjoy it? But you had to learn, and and that's that's a basic, simple little example there, but when it comes to growing in knowledge and wisdom, the more truth we learn about God, the more He's able to reveal to Himself through our pursuit of Him, the more we trust Him, the more we come to know Him, the more we depend on Him, and the more we understand, the greater our love grows. So I'm just going to question, I just think about this from a logical point of view. Would you love Jesus as much today if it wasn't a pursuit of you really truly pursuing him and finding out how much he loved you or if he just told you I loved you and just left you alone? I tend to think that it's through the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom and and pursuing what he did for us and understanding why he did for us that allows our love to grow. Because let me just tell you, some of you are not easy to love. And you're looking at a guy that's not easy to love. But because of God and because of what we know about Him and His personality, His character, His morality, as we grow in knowledge and wisdom of Him, we begin to love like He does. It says that in here, uh, that, that they'd be knit together in love to reach all of the fuel assurance. There's something to be said about this pursuit of growing in wisdom and in knowledge. God wants to invest ourselves in His relationship. For our maturing and our solidifying our identity in Him. Why knowledge and wisdom, though? Why does He say knowledge and wisdom? A lot of times we'll say grow in knowledge, grow in wisdom. Aren't they the same? I, I want to tell you, I think the Bible teaches today here that, the, that this is not the truth. Simply answered, knowledge is the ability to assess a situation and decide a practical course of action. Some of you are full of good knowledge. Some of you not so much. Wisdom is the power to follow through on the truth. William Barclay puts it this way in one of the commentaries I read. Knowledge is that by which man grasps the truth. Wisdom is that by which man is enabled to give a reason for the hope that is in him. You know, it's, it's one thing to say, well, I'm a believer in Jesus. He saved me. But it's a whole other reason to be able to use wisdom and give reasons on why you have this hope that you have. We need wisdom and knowledge in our lives to fully be all in and understand our identity that is in Jesus Christ. So to not be tossed and fro like waves doing it to us, and allowing Satan to have this kind of control, we must become proficient in the knowledge and the wisdom of who is Jesus. And it requires something of us. It requires us to surrender by faith to Christ And then allow him to finish the good work in which he started in the first place. So what practices do you have in your life that currently you have set up to help you grow in wisdom and knowledge of God? I'm not going to preach today on all the stuff that we have set up here. If you want to know, just look in the bulletins. If you want to know what we do on Wednesday nights, what you want to know about life groups, if you want to know about discipleship groups, we will answer all of those questions for you. But listen, I'm just here to tell you, we are doing everything we can as pastors, as leaders of this church, to give you every opportunity you can to grow in knowledge and wisdom of God because it's going to increase in your identity of who Christ is in your life and allow you its benefit, listen, of overcoming Satan's control in your life. Is Satan controlling things in your life? Is he tempting you? Is he, are you giving in to these temptations? It might be because he's needing you to grow and wanting you to grow. So he can complete the good work he began in you. You must grow in wisdom and knowledge of God. Here's the second thing that I want you to see that we need as far as understanding our identity. We need a proper understanding of theology. What is theology? We throw these big words around, and I'm going to throw some at you. I threw proficiency at you. It's becoming an expert, if you will. But what what is theology? Theology, simply put, is the study of God. 
And we need good theology in our life. Look at what he does. He moves on verse 6 and says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So what is growing in knowledge and wisdom there for? Why, why do we study these things? Why do we want to grow in wisdom and knowledge? So that we can have a better understanding of who God is. This is what theology is. Listen, I, I'm convinced of this. I, I've been convinced of this for a long time. Long before I ever felt the call to be a pastor. This is one area I felt like the church was doing wrong. I felt like the church was becoming too much like a concert. Or too much like a movie theater. Or too much like a show. I believed that that was happening in the churches all across America. And I was experiencing some of them in churches that I was attending. I thought it was wrong. Because here's what I learned. It's the job of the pastor to equip and teach theology. I mean, heck, isn't that what most people think? I'm just going to come and listen to what the pastor has to say. He's the one that went to school for it. He's the one that's been trained in it. Can I be honest with you? Most pastor's degree are not in theology. They're not. Mine's not. Mine's in evangelism and church planning. I've had to study theology. I've had to learn theology. I've had to learn how to exegete things out of Scripture, how to study the Bible. But listen, we're all to be theologians. Every one of us are to learn how to study the God, that, that, to study about God. I don't find in Scripture that it's just the pastor's job. It's all of ours as believers to grow in our knowledge and understanding of who God is. It is part of our identity. Paul said, walk in him, be rooted and built up. I got to thinking about this idea of rooted and built up. I mean, you know, without a, without a good solid root base, a tree will fall. We've just been through many storms where trees that weren't really solid and didn't have their chance or had other problems in their way to get their root bases established have fallen over and they caused chaos, didn't they? They, they killed property line, uh, uh, power lines. They, they fell on people's houses. They fell on people's car because a strong tree can't stand without a solid root base. And can I tell you what I think if we use this analogy that's happening in the church today is there's many of us, I think even in the pastors and pulpits all across America, there are many that want to be the tallest tree in the forest. And they're willing to do whatever it takes to get there as fast as possible. And what happens is they spring up and they get really big and they get really seen and then they fall. And why do they fall? Because they never establish the root system that is required to hold a tree that tall. Listen, our, our identity is built on our theology. Who is God? I mean, this is what we battle as believers when we try to defend our faith in God every day. We have to be able to answer this question. Who is God? Is he simply just a rule giver? You know, there's people out there that feel that way about God. Some people feel that he's like Zeus. He's just this God of judgment and he's ready to send a lightning bolt at you and strike you down because you stole a piece of bubble gum from your best friend's purse. That's how they see God. Some see God as he's so forgiving, such a loving God that I can go do what I want, when I want, how I want, because God is a God of grace. We need a proper understanding of God. Because of grace, which you understand comes from his mercy, a price had to be paid. An extreme price, a great price, had to be paid in order that he could offer grace. So we need to know who God is. Solid theology will help us answer the questions that we face. Paul gives us some, some theology here that I think is, is good, and he teaches us a little bit about God, and he tells us uh, the reason that he's teaching this is that we would not be taken away by human philosophy, deceit, tradition he goes on to say according to the elemental spirits of the world not according to christ it's one of the ways that satan works in the lives of believers and those that are trying to find their way to god let's just say that in that way we'll leave that alone but he uses human philosophy deceit or tradition listen i'm gonna, I'm gonna go on record here and tell you that, listen we're gonna have some catholic friends who are in heaven with us we're going to have some people who claim Catholicism as their, as their religion, and they're going to be in heaven with us because they believed. But you know what the problem with Catholicism is? And why most people who give their lives to the Catholic tradition, and they're not going to make it, it's because of that. They have put tradition and their own writings over the Bible. And they would prefer to teach those things than the Bible. 
Which is, what Mark, which is what got Martin Luther fired up and why we have Scripture in our hands today is because he said we should be able to read and understand the Bible. We should be able to approach the thrones of grace as Scripture teaches, which they held private. So Paul says, I want you to be able to get rid of human philosophy, deceit, or tradition. How do we stand up against some of those false religions like Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness? How do we stand up against those blatantly against God? How do we defend ourselves against atheists and agnostics? I mean, we need good theology. Paul's going to give us some here today. And so it's going to protect us from these false ways. Because the Bible teaches this, that there's only one way, one truth. And one life. So here in verse 9. It's him. Look at verse 9. For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. Do you see this about Jesus? Do you understand this about the deeper theology of God? Is that Jesus is God? I know it sounds so simple to say, but this is one of the issues that really compounds things and makes things difficult when we think about our identity in Christ is that Jesus is God. Christ is the second person of the Trinity of God. God is God. Jesus is God. We have to come to a full understanding of that. Jesus is fully God, yet fully Man, so if we can trust God, what else can we do? We can trust Jesus. He is the manifestation of an invisible God. Amen. We've spent time in John before where we've read that in the word, beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. Go to Genesis 1, in the beginning God created. Go down in John chapter 1 and you see that it was the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us. This, my friends, is important theology for you and I. Jesus has to be, as verse 9 says, the fullness of deity bodily. Why is this so important? Why is God... Christ being God and us understanding this and admitting this is so important because here's the truth. It was going to require a perfect sacrifice in order to satisfy and to pay a price that God required of his law. But here's the problem. Scripture is very clear that all men sin and fall short of the glory of God. All men conceived naturally, male or female, all people conceived naturally in the human way that God created are sinners and far from God. Which means that there was no way outside of Jesus for us to have that price paid, period. Not going to happen. No sinner could do it. So yet God sent Jesus to live a sinless life, to fulfill the law that he had, so that he could then be condemned on our part. Therefore, dying in our part. Therefore, raising from the grave that you and I could be saved. That he sent his own son to redeem sinful, fallen man. So I don't trust in human tradition. I don't trust in law. I, I don't trust in all of those things. I trust in the person of Jesus who by the way is God he goes on to talk about circumcision in the Old Testament Genesis chapter 17 y'all aren't going to see this on the screen but uh, in Genesis chapter 17 and verses 10 through 11 we see the commandment that 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 God gave them that they would circumcise all circumcise all the males that were Jewish and and by this this would be a sign that they would be known that they are believers in God that they are the ones that were chosen they are the ones that are saved it was a sign to represent that and oh how did they go wrong with that they quickly turned it into it was a seal It was evidence of their salvation. It meant that if a person got, got circumcised, they were saved. How they twisted that teaching, it, that, that, it, that it was wrong, that this was an outward expression of an inward change. This was a really, truly, honestly, a heart situation that led to their salvation. I'm here to tell you that if we still had to deal with Old Testament laws and I became a believer as an adult, there's only one way I'm dealing with circumcision as an adult, and that would be because of my faith and my change in Christ, and he called me to do it. I'm not going through that because I want to. I'm going through it because he changed my heart. He gave me a new heart and a new life. And listen, we think that we, it's, it's taught a lot still today that Old Testament, that circumcision was what was required. 
it was required as a sign. Because the Bible in the Old Testament spoke of circumcision as a sign all over the place. It spoke of circumcision of the lips. It spoke about it of the heart. It even spoke about circumcision of the ears. And yet we focus on this other issue of circumcision, that this is what led to salvation. It was an outward sign of something greater. It was an outward, it was a personal decision to choose God and follow Him. That's what circumcision was supposed to represent. Not this physical act of circumcision, not circumcision of a body part, but circumcision of the heart, which was done. By the way, according to what Paul says here, in our theology, understand that he says it was not, it was made without hands. It had to be something that's happening inside. Paul quickly moves on to baptism. And we today use this as our sign of a changed person, of a repentant and regenerated heart, is that we would move to baptism as a sign. Not, no longer circumcision, but baptism. Listen, we get it wrong in a lot of churches. I'm not a big fan. I don't believe in Pedio baptisms. I don't believe in baptisms of babies. I do not think that baptizing a baby saves one. Just like circumcision didn't save one. Baptism is a result of an inward change that you must be able to confess. Babies cannot confess a trust and a faith in Christ. And so therefore, I do not believe that baptism of babies should be done. We must choose to follow him. So does baptism save us? No. Baptism doesn't save us. But, but here's what I want you to understand about baptism. It is important. It is of extreme importance. It is one of the ordinances, too, that we practice. The Lord's Supper and baptism. Baptism is something that we do when we give our life to Christ. It is something that we should want to do. We should want to express this sign of what God did in our life. We should want to represent Him being dead and buried below the water and raised up to new life. We should want to do this as an outward expression of an inward change. Circumcision has always been about the heart. Baptism is always about the heart. It is the sign of God regenerating you and giving you a new heart and a new identity. See, our identity allows us to live above Satan's control. Because our identity is in Christ, who is God, who lives in us. So listen. Go home with this truth today. If you have Christ, He's regenerated your heart, and He is in you, and you are in Him, then there's no room for Satan. There's no room. We have to have a growth of wisdom. We have to grow in knowledge, and we have to have growth and understanding of theology. Paul went through this all here, but here's the last thing that I want you to see. This is the, this is the good part. While we toil and we strive, as, as Paul talked about in verse 29 of, chapter, of verse one, chapter 1, for this toil I struggle, as he's struggling to grow in knowledge and wisdom and maturity and theology, as he's struggling. Listen, here's the beautiful thing about who Christ is. He gives us privileges. It's not like he just says, do this and toil, and by the way, there's no privileges in it. Yes, we can hope for all the privileges that come in eternity, but I'm here to tell you that there are privileges to live for Jesus today. Who we are in Christ. See, when sin entered the world, separation with God occurred. Man had chosen that they thought they could know more God and know more about God and, and actually become God themselves. And so since they made this choice, we know the scripture, since we made the choice, the Bible says that God departed from them, he left them, he had no desire to be with them, and not, there was a consequence for this, and this consequence for his departure was death. And listen, you need to understand what that death was. That death was eternal death. If they want to live in sin against me and not follow me, I am going, they will die and there will be an eternal separation from God. But here's the beautiful thing. God in his mercy made a way. We just discussed the, the need for solid theology in our life. So in solid theology, what you need to understand about God, this was not an afterthought. Jesus was not an afterthought. God knew Adam and Eve would sin against him. 
He knew that he would have to leave them and be separated from them because he could not be constantly in the presence of sin. And so he created a plan from the very beginning of time that we could know about in the very beginning of his book that he had a plan to redeem his people and to restore that relationship. It's found in Genesis chapter 3. Go all the way back to the beginning and we see God's plan here. Verse 15 of Genesis 3 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. This is God talking to Satan and he says, He shall bruise your head. Who is the he? The he is Jesus. It says, and you shall bruise his heel. Listen, what, Jesus, what God is saying is, it's gonna, you're going to think you win. You're going to strike at his heel, but he's going to squash your head. See, when Adam and Eve ate and responded to Satan over God, that's really what happened. God said, don't do this. Satan said, do this. And they responded to Satan. When they did this, Satan had felt like he defeated God. So we're going to see today what these privileges are then in living with Jesus today. In Genesis 3, God's talking about Jesus. It's from Genesis 3 all the way to today. It's always been about Jesus. It's always been about His plan to redeem people from a fallen state of sin. And when you give your life to Christ, you now take on His identity. You you live redeemed, and there are privileges that come with this redemption. I want to give you some of them today. Um, Here you go. Your debt. You owe a debt. Sin is a debt. We owe it. And the Bible says here that we see in, cha- in, in, in chapter 2, verse 14, uh, and we can go back to a little bit in 13, it says, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. What a privilege. How does it make you feel? Does it put a joy inside your heart? Does it put a sense of comfort inside your heart? Does it give you a sense of peace that you know you were once defeated and deserving of death in a real place called hell? And yet Jesus said, hey, one of the privileges is coming to me is I will cancel your record of debt. Listen, we're going to have, we hope to have a celebration uh, in December of 25, if not January of 26. We're hoping and praying that God's going to continue on the path of being debt-free in another 15 months. Some of y'all, almost four and a half years ago, never would have thought it was even possible. Let me tell you, your pastor wasn't even sure it was possible, but God. Okay? I'll tell you that story of what God's done to put all those things in place and all the, all the goods and the bads that went with it, but we are on track to do what God's leading us to do to have our debt paid off. Listen, how great of a feeling is it knowing that our debt's about to be paid off? How many of you have paid a debt off? How many of you have paid a car off? How many of you have paid a home off? Ooh, what freedom it is when you don't have somebody controlling you because you have to write a check every week. Listen, this is what Jesus did by declaring you debt-free. You no longer owe for your sins any longer it doesn't matter listen it doesn't matter if you've murdered somebody raped somebody or just stole a piece of bubble gum you are a sinner separated from God for all of eternity and the Bible says it doesn't matter what your past is like it doesn't matter how bad you think you've been Jesus said I forgive you I cancel your debt I don't know. That should make you happy that should put joy in your life that Jesus himself being the full nature fully God Fully human, dying on a cross, shedding his blood for you, canceled your debt. This is a privilege. You could have never paid that debt. The demand was too high. But Jesus forgave you fully, completely. And let me explain this to you. To remember it no more. How many of you keep bringing up past debt you owe in your own life? How many of you keep thinking about a past sin you committed in your life at some point in time? And, and, and Listen, you need, if you remember that, you need to tell Satan, yep, you know what, that did happen, but God put it on the cross and he sees it no more. That's not me. That's not my identity, Satan. 
My identity is pure. My identity is in God. My identity is with God. And He has forgiven me. He has wiped away all of my debt to never remember it again. This is a privilege, my friend, that you have in Christ. Just respond to Him but Jesus. Because here's what I know. Satan can't stand under the blood of Christ. Can't do it. You can. And when you stand under that blood, the Bible says you are forgiven. And your debt has been paid. The Bible also says that you are justified. That this payment for your sin has been paid in full. Verse 14 goes on by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. This is important for us to understand the nailing of the cross because in the old day, when somebody owed a debt, they wrote things on what's called papyrus. I didn't know this until studying it, but they wrote in ink. Okay? And one of the reasons we have a hard time reading and understanding, say, old documents that we find to validate whether they're authentic or not is because the ink they used, y'all get this, I didn't know this, the ink that they used didn't have acid in it. The ink we use today has acid in it, so when we write it on paper, it's what allows it to bite into the paper and therefore stick. And while we can read our writing that's ink written so many years later like we just wrote it, it bites to the paper. They didn't have acid in the ink in the days when they wrote on the papyrus. And so what would happen was, is like if I went into a contract with somebody and I owed them a debt, they would write this on papyrus. And when the debt was paid off, they would simply take an eraser like we do almost pencils and they were able to just wipe it off like a dry erase board, just wipe it off the papyrus. They were justified. Their debt was paid. It was done in full and therefore erased to never be remembered again. Remember, this is what Jesus does for us by canceling our debt. But it was written on a piece of paper and then wiped off. It was justified. When they would put criminals on crosses, they would put signs up there to explain their charge and it would be written and and that would that way they were paying their debt to society have any of you ever heard that statement that's what they were doing is that was their charge and their payment to society to pay that debt off was their death and so when jesus hung himself on that cross and shed his own blood. What Jesus did, therefore, for you and I, through justification, was he nailed our sins to that same cross. And it was his blood that poured over that. When we give our lives to him and we trust him with our life, that blood pours over our debt to never be seen again. We are now justified. We have been set free in Christ. It's a privilege. You're forgiven. You're set free. You're justified. And then there's this last area of privilege. Verse 15 says this, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him. Look look at this privilege. Jesus won. It's done. The the Bible says that Jesus won. Listen, we, we read this in eschatological view sometimes, and that's the end times, the study of the end times, and we think, no, he hasn't won because he hasn't come back yet. That is not true, church. Jesus won that day on the cross, and three days later, God proved it by raising him from the dead. This victory is complete. It is over. It doesn't have to happen again. It hasn't seen its final consummation. But the Bible says right here in verse 15 that by Jesus nailing the debt to the cross, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. He did that the day he resurrected, the day he died on that Christ. We teach theology. I'm not going to get into all this today. But the Bible says that he went down, he went to Sheol, he went and he triumphed over Satan. Listen, that day that Jesus died, Satan knew he was defeated. That day he thought he won in the garden, Jesus proved wrong the day he died. It was done. That victory was over. And you and I have this privilege in Jesus that we too know that when we give our life to Christ, the battle is over. It is done. When you understand your identity in Christ, church, how can Satan have any control over you? Now, that sounds simple, though, doesn't it, Pastor? Yeah, I struggle. You struggle. 
But what is he saying here? Paul's saying continue on. Continue pursuing knowledge. Continue to pursue wisdom. Continue to understand my theology. And when you really start grabbing this, you realize all you got to do is claim Jesus over Satan and it's over. It's a privilege. You don't have to triumph over your enemy. Jesus already did it for you. He's already paraded around. He's already canceled your debt. He's already justified you. And he's already triumphed in front of Satan. Listen, whether he comes back today, tomorrow, or a million years from now, listen, we're all going to be part of that process. Because it's already done. And so we are in Christ. We have these privileges. And so I think it's important that we just go back to the takeaway today. If they can put it up on the screen. Understanding our identity in Christ allows you to live above Satan's control. Church, I hope it's has encouraged you today. There's a reason why I chose Colossians. A, a friend of mine, I'll give you this and then we'll close. A friend of mine said, why are you preaching through another letter of Paul? Can, can I be honest with y'all for a second, church? I hope you're benefiting from the study in Colossians so far. But your pastor needed Colossians. If I am confessing to you I was beginning to question how sufficient is Christ in my life if things aren't going the way I think they should go. If things aren't happening the way I think they should happen. Whether in personal relationships with friendships, whether it was in marriage relationships with Sherry and I, whether it was in the relationships with the church or not, I started seeking, God, I need need you to be sufficient in my life and I need to know it. I I need to grow in knowledge and wisdom. I need to grow in my theology of you. I need to understand you more. And Colossians is about the supremacy of Christ. And so if we're going through it together, but I'm just here to tell you that God is taking me through it. And so I may be standing up here preaching a message to you about things that you can look at and identify in your own life, but you just need to understand God is doing the same thing in your pastor's life. I'm human like you are. I struggle like you struggle. And we all need this. We all need to be able to come back and understand our identity in Christ so that we can live above Satan's control because that is exactly what we face every day is the attack of Satan. I I wish I could stand here and tell you what my week was like last week and how many people needed to hear this actually specific thing the same week I'm trying to prepare to preach it. There were a lot of people in my office last week. I'm just just telling you, it, it all goes back to the fact that when we identify in Christ, it sure makes the dark times a little easier. And you know what it makes me do? It makes me realize that I can count it, I can count it worthy that I'm in those dark moments. Do you count those times in your life worthy that you are being persecuted for the cause of Christ? It's not easy to do, is it? We we want to point the finger and say, why me, why me, and run from it. But I'm here to tell you, you should count it worthy that Satan wants to attack you. Because guess who he's attacking? Christ in you. And so when we identify our relationship with Christ, man, it helps us live above Satan. Because the only only one that I know of in this scripture who ran from Jesus, uh, that Satan ran from, was Jesus. Matter of fact, I see in scriptures where Jesus, Satan and his enemies actually say, these people we don't know, but Jesus we know. We need our identity in Christ. It needs to be fixed. We need to be growing in wisdom and knowledge. We need to be understanding the theology of God. And then when we do this, we will begin to experience all the privileges that we have in Jesus. And these dark places won't be so dark. I'm going to ask the band to come. We're going to pray. It'll be a time of invitation. Maybe today you do not have an identity in Jesus. Maybe it's because you didn't understand the theology of God. Maybe it's because you didn't understand that that God in Himself became fully human and died for you so that by His blood shed on that cross, you could have your debt completely gone. Maybe you've never truly trusted Jesus. Maybe you say, oh, I believe in Him. But, but is your identity in Him? Are the fruit that you're bearing because of your identity that you're following Jesus? Today you can come and see Pastor Gary. I will be up front to receive you, to talk to you about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to get baptized. Maybe you want to join the church. Whatever your decision is, this is not an invitation to come get saved. This is an invitation for you to respond to what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life, whether it's for salvation, whether it's for repentance, restoration, whether it's for some other reason. These altars are always open. I want to encourage you to respond during this time of how the Holy Spirit's leading you. So would you join me as we pray? God, we come to you now in an important time of the service. 
where we have worshipped you in song, we have read your scripture in a call to worship, God, of how you have already done all these things for us. We had a time of prayer, of loving you, confessing our sin to you, thanking you, God, requesting things for you. Pastor Gary led us in a lovely prayer as a corporate body. We worshipped you even more and took up tithes and offerings, God, giving back to you through our response in that because we love you. And then we heard from your word. Which is why we're all here. And so God, I pray that your word does not return void. Your Bible says that it won't return void. That it's speaking to somebody today. And so God, I pray that you have your way. I pray the Holy Spirit's powerful. And his power will cause us to respond in ways that you've called us to respond. Whether it's coming and praying. Whether it's joining the church. Baptism, salvation. God, whatever it is you're doing. I pray right now that you have your way. And there will be no hindrance of Satan in this building. So God, I pray your hand moves in a mighty way. God, may your will be done. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.